on this cold Sunday morning. It looks like winter's back for a few more weeks, but it's good to be able to warm up our souls in the presence of God, worshiping Him, sitting under the teaching of His Word. I pray that the Spirit of God would encompass you today and remind you of things you knew and maybe have, maybe have forgotten or teach you new things about His Word, about yourself, about the community of believers. Well, there's so much to learn from God's Word. And it's wonderful that we would learn it together. Let's stand and let's sing, There is a Redeemer. The words are on the screen for you. There is a Redeemer. Savior, we thank you uh, because you are our Redeemer. You have taken us back to yourself. And we thank you, Lord. We thank you for making us your children, for giving to us an inheritance that comes from your heavenly throne. We thank you, Lord, for giving to us a title that calls us children of God. And we thank you, Lord, for being our Father who has promised never to leave us, never to forsake us. Our God, though we cannot see you, we know you live. And, and though we cannot touch you, you have proven your existence again and again. And for that, we praise you, for having not alienated us from yourself, for having not left us to ourselves, but having come that we would know you and worship you and enjoy you forever. Amen. You may be seated. This morning's scripture reading will be the entirety of chapter 17 in the book of Judges. Judges 17 is a narrative of a man named Micah whose love for money compelled him to steal from his mother. In return, her, her love for money compelled her to curse her son. Later, Micah creates idols for his home and hires a pagan priest for his estate. He then ordains a Jewish priest to lead worship of the God of the Bible in his home. Micah thought that he could serve two gods, the God of this world and the God of the Bible. 
he was sadly mistaken. Chapter 17. There was a man of the hill country of Ephraim, whose name was Micah. And he had said to his mother, the 1,100 pieces of silver that were taken from you, about which you uttered a curse, and also spoke it in my ears. Behold, the silver is with me. I took it. And, as his, and his mother said, Blessed be, my, I'm sorry, Blessed be my son by the Lord. And he restored the 1,100 pieces of silver to his mother. And his mother said, I dedicate the silver to the Lord from my hand for my son to make, carve, make a carved image and a metal image. Now, therefore, I will restore it to you. So when he restored the money to his mother, his mother took 200 pieces of silver and gave it to the silversmith, who made it into a carved image and a metal image. And it was in the house of Micah. And the man Micah had, sh and the man Micah had a shrine, and he made an ephod and household gods, and ordained one of his sons, who became his priest. In those days there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. Now there was a young man of Bethlehem in Judah, of the family of Judah, who was a Levite, and he sojourned there. And the man departed from the town of Bethlehem in Judah to sojourn where he could find a place. And as he, as, as he journeyed, he came to the hill country of Ephraim, to the house of Micah. And Micah said to him, Where do you come from? And he said to him, I am a Levite of Bethlehem in Judah, and I am going to sojourn where I may find a place. And Micah said to him, Stay with me, and be to me a father and a priest, and I will give you ten pieces of silver a year and a suit of clothes, and your living. And the Levite went in, and the Levite was content to dwell with the man, and the young man became to him like one of his sons. And Micah ordained the Levite, and the young man became a priest and was in the house of Micah. Then Micah said, Now I know that the Lord will prosper me because I have a Levite as a priest. This morning we are going to be taking a look once again at 1 Timothy chapter 6. Um, we're winding down in our study on how to build the church of Christ. 1 Timothy is about that very topic. What we're going to see this morning is how to fight the good fight. Last week we talked about what fights we fight and is it worth fighting for the Christian faith. And this morning we'll look at how to fight the good fight. If you're visiting with us, welcome. It's good to have you. If you're online, welcome. We would love to have you here with us. And it's good to be able to worship the Lord together. Let's stand and let's sing, For God So Loved the World. For God so loved the world That he gave his only Son That whosoever believes Will not perish They shall have eternal life I shall hold I shall hold to God alone, for His love has salvaged me, for His love has set me free, for God so loved the world that He Whosoever believes will not perish, they shall have eternal life. I 
I shall wait upon the Lord. I shall wait upon His word, and by His grace I am released. By His grace I am redeemed. For God. So love the world that he gave his only son, that whosoever believes shall not perish, they shall have eternal life. By his precious blood, I have been set free. For the glory of Jesus' name, I surrender all now to Christ alone. In Jesus I am saved by His precious blood. By His precious blood I have been set free for the glory of Jesus' name. I surrender all now to Christ alone. In Jesus I am saved. For God so loved the world that He gave His only Son that whosoever They shall have eternal life. For God so loved, for God so loved the world that He gave His only Son that whosoever believes shall not perish. They shall have eternal life. Please be seated. Please open in your scriptures to the New Testament book of 1 Timothy. And before I proceed, I just want to mention that this has been an eventful week for my wife and myself as our daughter in law gave birth to our second grandchild a little boy named Henry Paul, and uh, nine pounds, six ounces, so a big boy, very big boy. And thank you for those of you who are praying for Gina and for Tyler and little Maggie. And, and bear with me as a grandfather as I tell the story yet again. The baby was due uh, on a Friday, but Monday the baby was still not here. And so little Maggie, his bigger sister, was praying that night before she went to bed. And she said, Lord, please help Henry find a better way out. <laughs> help Henry find a different way out, <laughs> uh, the way children think. And lo and behold, apparently he did, because on Valentine's Day he was born. And everybody is well and home, and we look forward to seeing them soon. Our text is 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 11 and 12. In most of your Bibles, there will be a heading there that says, Fight the Good Fight of the Faith, with this understanding that this is an inclusion by the translators. And the actual manuscripts, the Greek manuscripts, do not give these headings, but that's for our better understanding and reading. And, and verse 11 is part of the Bible, as is verse 12, and it reads this way. But as for you, O man of God... Flee these things, pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, steadfastness, gentleness. Fight the good fight of the faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called and about which you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. Well, as I noted earlier, last week we were looking at these same two verses, but we used it as a foundation for this morning's message. 
And we talked about various things. I believe it was nine in all things that we fight for in life. You know, recall, we fight for wealth. We fight for health. We, we fight for, well, there's so many things we fight for. And many of those uh, elements that we strive for in life are worthwhile, are valuable. One, you'll remember, was not the fight for power. However, none of these, none of the, those things listed were part of the good fight. They were maybe part of the essential fight or things we choose to fight for. However, only one is labeled as the good fight, and that's what we see here. It is the good fight for the faith, for your faith in Jesus Christ. Many things to fight for, but only one is deemed good. The good fight for the faith. And the question was asked whether or not Christianity is worth fighting for. And I'm sure you knew the answer I was going to give to you before I ever said it. The answer is yes. And you would think, well, what else would a preacher say? But I didn't say that because I'm a preacher. I said it because the Bible says it is. And, well, anyone who fights the good fight of the faith knows as well by experience that it certainly is worth fighting for. It's a crucial fight. It may be the hardest fight of all. And yet a necessary fight. Yes, Christianity is worth fighting for. The fact that it's called the good fight puts in contrast all the other things we may strive for. And it labels the Christian fight and the Christian faith as being superior and the others being lesser. Now, there are many things to fight for in life, but none of them compare to the importance or the value, or the end result of the good fight for the faith that has been entrusted to you by Christ himself. Fight on, my friends. There's many things to fight for in life. But choose your fights wisely and do not neglect the fight for your faith and make it your primary fight. All other fights will leave you injured. This one will give you eternal life. Jude chapter 1, verse 3, reads this way. Contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. You are the saints, and you are called to contend, fight, for that faith that was entrusted to you. Here, in the text that I just read to you from 1 Timothy 6, we see that this fight, this good fight for the faith, requires that we that we pursue four virtues or better yet six virtues in four different ways we are to fight and paul gives to us here four exhortations which leads to these virtues that we just read a few minutes ago an exhortation is an emphatic urging for somebody to do something. Your parents probably were very exhorting when they told you to clean up your room. Uh, your, your boss may be very exhorting. Certainly it's a preacher's job to be exhorting. In fact, Paul tells Timothy in chapter 6 and verse 2, he says, teach and urge these things. In other words, he's giving them an exhortation, giving Timothy an exhortation to give exhortations urge be emphatic about it don't be passive don't be laid back you need to show to them how important this is and so my job this morning as best as i can is to convey to you how important these these things are and there are four exhortations that we can summarize into four words flee pursue fight and hold flee pursue fight and hold in these two verses 11 and 12 and beginning there at verse 11 you see that first exhortation to flee flee paul is speaking here of course to pastor timothy he's a young pastor in fact he he says but as for you O man of god but he's also speaking not only to timothy but this is an instruction for the whole church there in ephesus and my friends, let me remind you, if he's speaking to Timothy and he's speaking to, to the church in Ephesus, likewise he's speaking to us. This is an exhortation for us as well. 
Th these, of course, are the qualities that a pastor must have before he can become a pastor. But it's also, these are also qualities, virtues that everyone ought to have if they profess Christ as Savior. Listen, if you know Christ is your Lord and Savior, you should be pursuing these qualities. You should be fleeing certain sins. Paul here says, flee these things. Now, if you're anything like me, your tendency is to casually move away from sin or maybe even to rubberneck to get a better glimpse at the sin. Some people very foolishly see how close they can get to the sin without falling into it. Paul here says, here's the directive, flee, run away, full speed. Uh, in fact, he says later on in the second letter, chapter 2, verse 22, he says, flee youthful lusts. Run from those youthful passions that are illicit, that are sinful. Flee. And what most men here will admit is that those youthful lusts don't go away when you become older. They're still there. So you have to keep fleeing. Flee. Don't linger. Don't dip your toe in to see whether or not it's warm. Don't take a sample, but rather run. Flee, escape, get away, break away from these things, is what Paul is saying. But of course, all that begs the question, what things? What things should I be running away from? Well, remember, when studying the scriptures, context, context, context are the three rules. Go back and read what Paul was talking about. Now, Paul has said many things so far that we should be running away from in terms of sin. But if we just stay within that chapter there, chapter 6, we have a mouthful already. He said, flee the sin of avarice or the love of money. Flee the love of money. Flee the temptation of being godly in order for you to gain. Remember that conversation? How some people present themselves as godly in order to gain, in order to gain from it. How artificial that is. Flee the snares of sinful desires. Flee temptations that will come if you do love money. You know, if you love money, there are things you would never dream of doing that you would be willing to do in order to get money. Flee it. Run. Don't look back. Just keep running from these things. Flee, Paul says, from anything that would cause destruction or ruin in your life. And most of the times we know it's possible, but for some reason we say, I'm going to be the exception. This won't hurt me as much as you think it will, Lord. And so we go back and we just test the water, see if it's, see if it's comfortable enough. Paul here says, flee anything that will bring ruin to you or ruin to your family or ruin to your church. Flee, run, full speed ahead. Also, verses four and five, he says, flee from divisive attitudes. Attitudes that bring division within the household of God. Flee from that as well. In fact, he says, flee, run away from doctrines that are different, that are not from the scriptures. Run from it. We may like them, but God says here, run from it. Don't walk away. Run. Run. Why? Because these will be the end of you. These will be the end of your good life. These will be the end of your reputation. These will be the end of your church. These will just bring about disaster. Flee from it. Almost always, the church is going to be a reflection of the character and teaching of the pastor. Few exceptions to that reality. And so here Paul is telling Timothy what he needs to be, knowing that the church is going to be a reflection of the pulpit. So he says, Tim, if you run from these things, you'll be teaching them to run from it as well. Notice verse 11, how Paul reminds Timothy of his significant calling. 
he says, but you, O man of God. That's a pretty, pretty big title, man of God. It's a title that we see given to Moses and to David and to the Old Testament prophets, man of God. Here, Pastor Timothy, young Pastor Timothy is being called man of God. Paul is underscoring the gravity, the, the, the enormity, the, the seriousness of being an ordained pastor in a household of God. Saying, you, man of God, Timothy's life must, as a pastor, conform to that title, man of God. Timothy had no option. You're a minister, an ordained minister in a household of God. Well, then be a man of God. It's rather sobering, isn't it? It sure is. I am reminded of what we just read in Judges 17. Uh, earlier this week, I was reading through a few chapters in Judges, and I came across Judges 17, in all honesty, a story I had uh, forgotten. And, and Gabe just read it to us. Micah and the Levite. Micah and the, it sounds like a, a band from the 1960s, doesn't it? Micah and the Levites, right? Uh, but it's not a good, good story at all. Here we have, just to recap what we've seen so far uh, as we looked at that one chapter, Micah, in the Old Testament, book of Judges 17, because of his love for money, he steals from his mother 1,100 pieces of silver. That was a lot of money. And eventually that money will be converted into a metal idol. It's going to be uh, um, um, melted down and, and molded into an idol of a false god. And, and whatever he has left, he goes out and buys or carves another uh, idol or two. And then Micah, now remember, he's supposed to be a good Jewish boy. He hires a pagan priest to live in his estate to manage the worship of these false gods with these idols. Meanwhile, he then hires a Levite, a Jewish man, and he ordains this guy to be a priest so that this priest will now lead in worship of the true God, the God of the Bible, in his house as well. So now you have Micah covering all the bases. He's got somebody to worship and pray to these false gods, and then one to worship and pray to the God of the Bible, he wants to make sure that he's got all the bases covered. And Micah's in big trouble, because you cannot serve two masters. You cannot have two gods, because one will be subject to the other. Not only that, but Micah suffers from another love, another god, and that's his love for money. Micah loves his money so much that he is disrespectful to his mother and he steals his mother's money. And Matthew Henry writes that he made his mother then so unkind. In fact, she loved money so much that she became so unkind as to curse her own son. He writes, troubles drive good people to pray, but it drives bad people to curse others. And that's what she did. You see, this woman's silver was her God way before it was actually melted down into a graven image. She was already worshiping her money. And then Micah, along with his mother, agreed to turn this money into a God and to set it up as an idol for worship in their family. And then they hired a man to oversee this pagan worship in Micah's estate. And then they flippantly ordain a Jewish priest to lead worship of the God of the Bible. They knew nothing about his character. He just happened to show up. They knew nothing about this man's calling into ministry. No, he just showed up. They knew nothing about this man's beliefs. Simply, they said, you're a Levite? Well, then you will serve as my personal priest. And you'll remember what we read there at the very end of the chapter, verse 13. 
He says, now I know that the Lord will prosper me because I have a Levite as a priest. Huh. Read the next chapter when you get a chance, and you'll see the disaster that befalls Micah. In order to fight the good fight, my friends, you have to flee the temptation. And there's so many kinds of temptations, but this is a big one, to have other gods in your life, to put other gods over the true God, small g gods over the capital G God, the God of the Bible. And they may very well be idols, but usually they're not, not in our culture, not in our day and age. Usually our gods are much different. Usually the biggest God we have is ourselves. I place myself over the God of the Bible. And then money. I place the, my passion, my worship of money over the God of the Bible. Oh, there are so many gods we could come up with. Flee the temptation. The church is built by those who flee these temptations. A church that does not flee these temptations will be a church that will soon enough close its doors. Run, run, run. Exhortation number one, flee. Exhortation number two, pursue. Pursue. If you are fleeing these temptations while you're running to something, what should you run to? If you are running from what is bad, you're running into something that is good. What should you run to? Well, here we see six virtues, six things listed for us. The first one is pursue righteousness. Pursue righteousness. Uh, righteousness has to do with your actions. Uh, it means that you do what is right. Pursue the goal of doing what is right. And, of course, it deals with the horizontal relationships, the relationships between us, between God's creation, me and mankind. And righteousness, of course, is the result of obedience. The more obedient I am, the more righteous I will be. Pursue that. And not only is it the result of obedience, but it's also a catalyst for obedience. The more righteous I want to be, the more willing I am to be obedient. Pursue righteousness. Not only that, but look here, it says, pursue godliness, godliness. And whereas righteousness deals with our actions, godliness deals with your character, who you are. It deals with the vertical relationship between you and your creator, God himself. It speaks to how you interact and how you respond to God. Be godly. Uh, to be godly, it means to be godlike. Not that you're going to be great and powerful and create, but no. But you're going to have the virtues of God, such as love, such as a desire for righteousness. The virtues of God by which you will learn to be gracious and merciful towards others. And of course, godliness comes with time. It doesn't happen overnight. And, and the more obedient you are to God, God's word, the more you will refine your godliness. Pursue that, is what Paul tells this young pastor. In order to pursue godliness, you need to mortify your sin. Mortify your flesh. In other words, put it to death. Not your flesh per se, but your sinful desires of your flesh. And the problem with that is that it's very hard. It's very hard to put aside the things I want the things that satisfy my physical cravings that are sinful. And yet, it is essential if you want to pursue godliness. To pursue godliness means that you reflect God in you. And it, by the way, it does come with a reward. If you, if you take a look at chapter 4 of 1 Corinthians, chapter 4 verse 2 tells us that we are to be stewards of what God has given to us. Verse 5 reads this way, God will bring to light the things now hidden in darkness, and he will disclose the purposes of your heart. Then each one will receive his commendation from God. God will commend you. God will reward you for how you pursue godliness. Here is 
the next virtue, faith. Faith. Faith is, very simply, trust in God. To pursue faith means that you have this untiring, dogged confidence that Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life, and that Christ is with you, just as he promised he would be. Faith. Uh, unfortunately, many will preach about faith, but not possess it themselves. One writer put it this way. Do not be a tailor who dresses up in rags. In other words, don't talk about faith, but not have it yourself. And of course, along with faith, there is love. That These two are the supreme virtues, faith and love, and that's the next one on our list, love. Love here, as you may have guessed, is the brand of love that's called in Greek agape. There are various types of love. I love my wife, I love chocolate, and I love my dog. But obviously, I do not love my wife in the same way that I love my dog. Right? The truth is, I don't have a dog. I'm not even an animal lover, sorry to say. <laughs> but for the sake of illustration, the loves are different. But there is one superior love, and that is what in the Greek language is called agape. Agape love. In, in English, it's all the same word, right? In the Greek, it's broken down for us. Agape. And, and agape is the kind of love that God has for us. It is an unconditional, unrestricted love. It's a love that continues to love even when it's, we're not loved back. Isn't that amazing? It's a difficult kind of love to exercise, isn't it? It's the kind of love that God has for you. He loves you even if you don't love him. He loves you even when you injure him. How unlike us. God says, pursue this sort of love. Agape love. Unfortunately, many will, will preach about this love but not possess it themselves. Don't be a chef who never tastes his own food. If you're going to, going to preach it, you need to practice it. Faith, love, and then there's steadfastness. Pursue steadfastness. And, and this word here means that there is an unwavering perseverance, that you continue you don't, you don't get winded, spiritually winded, but rather you continue to pursue after God. In fact, literally the word there means to remain under. Don't bail out. Don't run. This needs to be the Christian attitude. I will persevere. I will be steadfast in my pursuit of Christ. Flee temptation. Pursue steadfastness. And lastly, pursue gentleness. This is yet another Christian attitude. To be gent uh, gentle means that you are meek, that you are kind and compassionate. To be gentle means you are not vengeful. You cannot be vengeful and gentle. There's no such thing as gentle vengeance. Pursue gentleness. And though you are called to fight in the greatest cause ever given to man, you are to remain humble. Be gentle. These are the postures or the actions, the virtues, the attitudes that the Christian needs to pursue. You flee temptation and pursue these values. Be like a college student who's determined to get that degree. She wants a high GPA. Give it all you got. Be like an Olympic runner, determined to cross the finish line, and not only cross the finish line, but a determination to be first to cross the finish line. Pursue. Make these your life goals. Righteousness, godliness, faith, love, steadfastness, and gentleness. Against these, there are no laws. 
Exhortation number three, fight. In verse 12, first one is to flee, the second is to pursue, the third is to fight. Fight the good fight of the faith. Now, we talked last week about the various fights we fight or engage in, uh, but this fight is far different. This is the good fight. It's good in the sense that it is the noble fight, the noble fight. And therefore, it's worthy of fighting. It's worthy of fighting because it has eternal consequences. All these other fights, all these other fights we fight in are temporary. They will end on the day you stop breathing. But this fight will have eternal consequences. Fight the good fight. How you fight this fight here on this earth will echo in eternity for eternity. <laughs> it's a big fight. It's the good fight. Now, when the Bible here says to fight, it's not talking about brawling. Put up your dukes. I'll show you. It, it, neither is it referring to arguing. Some people think that I need to fight and argue. No, that's not what it's saying. It, it's not referring to attacking or inflicting wounds on the enemy. No. And, and by the way, God's people are strange in that way. Uh, they're told to fight, and they literally fight. Um, they shoot their own. Now, God's people are very, very strange in that they are among the few that will shoot their own. Please do, Lord. <laughs> Seems like everybody believes that they are right. And they have reason to fight. That's not the kind of fighting we're supposed to engage in. Here, the word for fight means to agonize over. Agonize. Fight. For the Christian faith in you. Strive. Contend for the prize. Struggle. Uh, like one who's engaged in an intense athletic contest or, or maybe even in a warfare. Strive. Strive for the noble cause of Jesus Christ. Let me ask you a question, a serious question. I want you to think about it today, tomorrow, throughout this week. When was the last time you agonized over your faith in Christ? I know you thought about it. When was the last time you agonized over your relationship with Christ? Think about that. That's your homework this week. When was the last time you agonized over your faith in Christ? My friends, we do have to take regular inventory of our soul. Christian, you must engage in the great contest of the faith. And listen, it will require discipline. It will. It will also require intentionality. In other words, you need to think ahead and make choices based on Christ's values, on the goals I mentioned for you. You need to be intentional in that you are thinking ahead and making choices based on the truths of the Word of God. You need to be intentional in this fight. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, beginning of verse 26, reads this way. I do not run aimlessly. I do not box as one beating the air. He does not shadow box. But I discipline my body, and I keep it under control, lest after preaching to others, I myself may, should be disqualified. I myself would be a reprobate. I discipline myself. I don't swing at the air. I swing at the opponent. And the opponent is not you. I'm my own opponent. I'm my best opponent. I fight against my own sin. And you must do likewise. Flee, pursue, fight, and number four, hold. Hold. This last exhortation explains the goal of the fight. Hold, or take hold 
of the eternal life. It's the second half of verse 12. That is to say that as you live out your Christian life, keep your focus on the prize. This good fight has an eschatological purview. In other words, it, it doesn't only think about today, it thinks about the future. It thinks about the end times. It thinks about eternity. Fight today because it will have implications for eternity. Whereas doing these things are, will never save your soul. The, the, this list of virtues will never save your soul. However, these are evidences that your, your soul is saved. My friends, you will not pursue these virtues if you're not in Christ. If you desire and if you are in a process of pursuing these virtues, it is evidence that God is working in your soul, that your, the spirit, spirit of God is transforming your saved soul. But doing these things will not save your soul. Pursuing these things will not save your soul. Rather, it is an evidence that your soul is already in Christ. These are the sanctifying works of God in you and should be an assurance to you of your salvation. Thus, take hold of eternal life. This will be your trophy. This new life is a display of a new heart. It's not the source of a new heart. This eternal life is what Timothy was called to. Notice here it says, to which you were called. And Paul tells him not to forget, recall, keep it in mind. This calling was an act of God. And then there's Timothy's irresistible response. God called. He could no longer resist God any longer. And he turns to Christ in faith. And so we read here, Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called and about which you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. God's calling is followed by man's response, an act of faith in which the sinner entrusts his life to Christ himself. And he says, Take my life. She says, Take my life. Lord, and make it yours. It's the response that the Holy Spirit enables you to make. It's the response that the Holy Spirit enables the sinner to make through regeneration. It, hold on to eternal life because Christ holds on to your soul. And this is ultimately what the Christian is called to do. Take hold of the eternal life which Christ grants to you. Paul says, recall, Timothy, that this is the profession you made in front of many witnesses. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called and about which you made the good confession in the presence of many people who are watching. Well, this confession was initially first made when Timothy was baptized. When he believed in, the, in Christ and and he was baptized. And in fact, this is the purpose of baptism. It is a public confession that you identify with Christ and his church. Uh, it's an act that God calls us to. Listen, God calls the believers to be baptized. Make that public confession of faith. But in Timothy's case, this confession, this profession was announced a second time when Timothy was ordained into ministry, when he became a pastor. In fact, if you go back to chapter 4, verse 14, it tells us how a council of elders, a council of pastors, laid their hands on Timothy and ordained him into ministry. They examined Timothy. They examined his character. They examined his calling. They examined his creed, his beliefs. Every once in a while, I disappear for a week. Where do I go? I go to do just that with various men within our denomination who are looking to be ordained. And so my job is to help in this process of examining their character and their calling and their creed, what they believe. And in conjunction with their churches, 
these men are ordained into public ministry. These are the essentials, character, calling, and creed. And in this case, they found that Timothy was indeed being called by God and that his character was fitting for one who was in ministry and his beliefs were accurate. He knew the scriptures. He knew the word of God and thus, therefore, he was ordained. They acknowledged that God had prepared him, equipped him, and called this young man into the pastorate. And they acknowledged that he knew the scriptures and that he was able to teach the scriptures accurately. And so they ordained him publicly. Earlier, in chapter 1, verse 18, Paul said that by this ordination, Timothy, you may wage a good warfare. Fight the good fight of the faith. That's not just for ministers. It's not, not just for ordained pastors. No, it is an assignment given to every single believer. Christian, if you identify as a Christian, as a follower of Jesus Christ, this is a calling that's handed to you. Fight the good fight of the faith. There's many other fights you get involved in, but this is the superior, this is the primary, this is the only fight that's going to have eternal matter. Fight the good fight of the faith. In order to fight this good fight, you need to pursue righteousness, godliness, love, steadfastness, and gentleness. You need to flee from sin. You need to pursue the things of Christ. You must fight the good fight and take hold of the eternal life offered to you. Now go out and fight. Fight, fight, fight. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, thank you that you give to us not only a calling, but you give us the armor we need in order to fight the fight of the faith. And you give us, Lord, instruction as to how to fight. And Lord, you give us of your spirit that we would have the ability to fight. We pray that we would be able, able warriors in the quest of spreading your word and building your kingdom. Amen. Blessed be your name in the land that is plentiful, where the streams of abundance flow. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name when I'm found in the desert place, though I walk through the wilderness. Blessed be your name. Every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to praise. When the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. Blessed be your name when the sun's shining down on me, when the world's all as it should be. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name on the road marked with suffering, though there's pain in the offering. Blessed be your name. Every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to praise. When the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. You give and take away, you give and take away, my heart will choose to say, Lord, blessed be your name.
Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. Let's close with prayer. Our Lord and our God, we pray that indeed we would be able to bless you even as you have blessed us. Throughout this week, may we recall your goodness and may we elevate your name, your throne, above all other names, above all other idols that we may pursue. We ask, O oh God, that you would be not only first, but alone in our hearts. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen.